Thank you, Derek. You know, conference, it's definitely a case of who you know. I like to be centre of attention. Here I am, and the SEC in the stage all on my own, so thanks, Derek. It's good to have friends in the high places. But before I go on about the, uh, the motion itself, I'd like to mention someone who I've known for a number of years, and he's now the MSYP for Paisley. Osama, stand up just now. Osama Nadim is the MSYP for Paisley. Right, Osama, you're milking it now. Sit down, and you're definitely not getting my job. But conference, you know, we live in extremely challenging times. Westminster austerity and attacking, they're attacking the disabled, the unemployed and families throughout Scotland. The SNP Scottish Government has done what it can to make sure that we can, within the devolved settlement, to make sure that we can deliver and protect our people. But we need more powers in our Parliament. We need to make sure that our Parliament can deliver for Scotland's people. Labour or Tory at Westminster, it makes absolutely no difference. They're both the same, they both believe in the exact same thing. In fact, when did you ever think you would have a potential Labour Chancellor who would say after a Tory budget, I would change absolutely nothing? That's what's wrong with the system and that's what's wrong with Westminster. And we need our representatives to go down there and shake Westminster to the very foundation and to deliver for the people of Scotland. Our MPs will fight Scotland's corner, ensuring that the Scottish Parliament can deliver uh, for our people. We want to make Scotland the best place to grow up. The Scottish Government has worked towards this, and this policy of free school meals is one such thing. I have to declare an interest in this because recently I became a grandparent, and uh, Daisy is now three months old. So I've got a vested interest to make sure that Scotland is the best place to grow up. But what parent or grandparent doesn't want that for their country? I want to ensure that they get opportunities and uh, that it doesn't matter where you're born or where you live or who you are. It's the fact that you get that opportunity. And our First Minister has helped by announcing the £100 million attainment fund, ensuring, and currently we're discussing that in the Education and Culture Committee, of which I'm a member in the Scottish Parliament, and we're discussing it, how we can make things better, because I don't want to be standing here in 10 years' time saying that attainment is difficult, it's something we've done in the past and it's very challenging. It is, but it's something that we have to do and we have to make sure that young people get that opportunity. But we live in a country where Westminster's austerity are stopping many of our young people getting these opportunities. We have situations where benefit sanctions are stopping families from getting the basic slip money to be able to buy food. There's food banks in constituencies across the length and breadth of the country. So how do you expect a young child to be able to go to school when their stomach is rumbling? How can they attain or how can they study when they've got a problem with uh, not getting enough to food? How many children uh, will be motivated to excel? Life is challenging enough without having to worry where your next meal is coming from. And this is why the Scottish Government's policy will ensure that every primary one to primary three child will get a free school meal. This will benefit 135,000 additional pupils, saving families up to £330 per year for every eligible child. This investment can work towards eliminating the scourge of child poverty, but not alone. We should still work for further powers. And that is why I said earlier on, we need to make sure that Scotland's political map in May is painted yellow and we send as many MS, uh, uh, MPs to Westminster. Now, one of the things that I would say is, I can't wait to be sitting there in Paisley to see Mary Black elected as the member for Paisley and Renfrewshire South. Not just, not just because I am sick to death of hearing Douglas Alexander's spin and nonsense, not just because, quite frankly, I don't like him, but it's because of what people like him and his ilk have done to my town and communities throughout Scotland. It's time that we change that, and for us to do that, we have to get that power. So, conference, I say to you, Back this, back the Scottish Government, but there's much more work to be done and we have to deliver these MPs.
Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Job. And to second is Gordon MacDonald, MSP, to be followed by Alan Brown. Welcome, Gordon MacDonald. Good afternoon, conference. Our policy on free school meals is another part of the jigsaw in tackling child poverty in Scotland. In January, 135,000 additional pupils in P1 to P3 benefited from the policy, taking the total number of eligible children to 170,000. Scottish Government is providing 70 million of revenue funding to councils over two years to deliver the school meals commitment, plus a further 25 million of capital funding to prepare canteens, dinner halls, and other facilities in schools to meet the increased demand. Teachers I've contacted this week are in agreement that the policy is a good one and that receiving a healthy and nutritious midday meal is one of the most important factors in enhancing learning. Introducing free school meals has been described by the Scottish Free School Meals Campaign, which includes organisations such as Save the Children, Unison, EIS, the STUC and the Child Poverty Group as being a key measure in tackling poverty and promoting child welfare. So, we have hard-pressed families that are happy, teachers who see the benefits, councils who receive additional funding to upgrade their catering facilities and to meet the extra costs, and unions, along with child poverty groups, welcoming the introduction of free school meals. Yet, we find that the Labour Party, like on so many other issues, are on the wrong side of this argument. Last year, Labour voted against the SNP government motion to introduce free school meals. And during the stage three debate, Ian Gray, the Labour education spokesman, singled out free school meals as a measure that Labour could not support, stating that the budget, wrongly in our view, prioritised the policy. Then in January this year, when the free school meal policy started, Ian Gray issued a press release condemning their introduction. Conference, since when was it wrong to prioritise the needs of our younger children? Providing a free school lunch for every P1 to P3 child in Scotland is an investment in our children's future. But Conference, this is not the only policy area where Labour gets its priorities wrong. This week, we had the admission from the leader of the Labour Party, Ed Miliband, that the last Labour government was too relaxed about inequality. This follows on from Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Working Pension Secretary, stating that we are not the party of people on benefits, despite the majority of people on working age benefits being in employment. No wonder the many, many ex-Labour supporters who have joined the SNP are telling us we didn't leave the Labour Party, the Labour Party left us. <laughs> Conference, Labour has turned its back on the people. The SNP will always put the people first. Support the motion. Thank you, Gordon. And to speak in favour of the resolution, I call Alan Brown. And Alan is our candidate in Kilmarnock and Loudoun constituency. <laughs> to be followed by Bill Ramsey. Alan. Good afternoon, conference. It's an honour to be up here on the stage. I actually spoke a few years ago in Inverness and seconded a motion on school meals, so it's great to see it back on the agenda. I have a wee confession to make as well. One of the reasons I put my name in was all the other Westminster candidates seem to be speaking earlier on, and all my fellow delegates are, are saying, Alan, Alan, when are you going to speak? You need to get up there. So here I am. Um, it's a really easy motion to support. As we heard the two previous speakers say, um, this is a, a tremendous policy by the SNP, 
when we've got working people going to food banks. This is one way of giving um, our young children a square meal, a, a good, healthy, nutritious meal. Now, we know um, from previous studies that eating healthy actually helps improve school attainment. It helps with socialisation of school kids. It gives them a better choice and introduces them to other foods they might not otherwise get. And this is real important. It's about equality. It's about treating all kids the same. Now, we know as well that many children that actually would qualify for free school meals don't actually take the free school meals because their parents think there's a stigma in applying for free school meals and they don't want their kids badged that way. So therefore, I start out saying this is easy to support. As we heard from the previous speaker, yet somehow the Labour Party has opposed this. I just can't get my head around that. In the, the modern-day Labour Party, it seems you, you're, you're classified either as rich or you're classified as poor. And they seem to want any that the, they think deserves benefits are going to be classed as poor. And that goes back to that stigmatisation, and we need to protect our children from that. To so say... Labour, it's rich or poor and nothing in between, but equality is how we'll get real social justice. So universal benefits we must protect at all costs. Introducing policies like this school meals is real important. It's about equality and the way we get social justice is progressive taxation. We heard John Swanee say earlier on, he's introducing progressive taxation. That's how we get so, uh, social justice, not stigmatising people and classifying people as rich and poor and fighting a class war, but progressive taxation, universal benefits and policies like SNP, and that's why we need change in May the 7th. Final speaker is Bill Ramsey to speak in favour of the resolution. Bill Ramsey. Thanks, convener. Um, Bill Ramsey, Southside Central Branch, not of Los Angeles, but of Glasgow. That's Nicholas' constituency and soon to be Alison Thulis' constituency as well. I'm also convener of the Equality Committee of the Educational Institute of Scotland. That's uh, our country's biggest union, teachers' union, but also the world's oldest teacher trade union. While researching the role of my forebears, or to be more specific, women EIS forebears, and the part they played in the suffrage movement, I came across notes looking at the issue of Scottish child hunger written in 1908, 107 years ago. Yet only two weeks ago, my committee is having to try to put together advice for today's teachers and how to identify the hidden signs, and so, the subtle signs, and sometimes not so subtle signs, of child hunger. How to try and help those wains who, in desperation, try and hide their hunger, who feel it is shameful to be hungry. Yet, as you and I know, the shame should not have been felt by these wains. The shame should be felt by those politicians that put useless, profoundly dangerous nuclear bombs before thousands of hungry Scottish ch school children. Politicians for whom, where my Sunday language here, uh, for the prime, for, for politicians who see the prime utility of a food bank as a backdrop for a press conference, and you know who I'm talking about. My year's forebears over 100 years ago were trying to come to terms with child poverty. If they were asked in 1908 that in 2015, their successor would still be trying to overcome the problem of trying to learn with an empty belly. They simply wouldn't believe it. And yet Scotland's teachers, supported by Scotland's government, trying to swim against the tide of Westminster austerity, are having to do exactly that. But there is one feature of political life in 2015 that EIS women, at the heart of the campaign for Votes for Women, would understand if they were with us today. Facing down the bluster of a Westminster establishment, incredulous that their Westminster privilege, their myopic view of the world, their view of whose vote should count and whose vote shouldn't count, the collective how dare you view, they dared, you dare, the SNP dares, and we're going to win. And we're going to make sure that this really becomes history. Support the motion.
Thanks, Bill. There are no cards in against. Uh, George is waving his right to sum up. Aren't you, George? Thank you. Yes, he's nodding. And can I ask, conference, is this resolution passed by acclaim? <laughs> it is. Now we turn to resolution 22, protecting Scotland's poorest. And it's to be proposed by Ailey Whiteford, MP, and seconded by Kevin Stewart, MSP. And of course, Ailey is our candidate in Banff and Buchan. Ailey Whiteford. Good afternoon, conference. When the history books are written, I think that the greatest indictment of the Tory Lib Dem coalition will be that when faced with the aftermath of the 2008 financial collapse, faced with real economic challenges and hard political choices, they chose to put our poorest people on the front line of austerity cuts. They chose to let the 20% of lowest income households take the biggest hits. They chose to penalise disabled people through the bedroom tax, and they chose to cut support to low-income families. By next year, welfare reforms will have taken £6 billion out of the pockets of Scotland's most disadvantaged citizens. Much of that's come from cuts to working tax credits and family tax credits that help people in low-paid jobs support their families, and from the real terms cuts that have been to child benefit. Women have been particularly badly hit. Around three quarters of the cuts uh, are coming out of women's pockets, simply because women are more likely to be working in low paid jobs, uh, and they're more likely to be working part time while their children are growing up. And indirectly, children have been very badly affected too. Right across the income spectrum, families have seen reductions in their spending power and real terms cuts in their standard of living. The cuts are causing misery right across Scotland and perhaps the most obvious symptom of that is in the explosion of food banks that have sprung up in communities right across the country over the last couple of years. I pay tribute to the volunteers who are making sure that people don't go hungry, but let's be very clear. Really, there should be absolutely no need for food banks in a country as rich as Scotland. The rise of food banks, frankly, is a sign that austerity has not worked and that we need to set out on a different path. But conference, the most regressive measure of all undoubtedly has been the bedroom tax. I believe the bedroom tax will come to be seen as the hallmark of this Tory Liberal coalition just as surely as the poll tax has been the hallmark of the Thatcher years. In Scotland, 8 out of 10 of the households affected by the bedroom tax were the home of a disabled adult. Those already disadvantaged, those already having their income squeezed because of other welfare changes, those who already have least choice about where they live, they were the people targeted and disproportionately affected by the bedroom tax. I'm immensely proud of the fact that the Scottish Government made the political choice to protect those people by mitigating the bedroom tax for every single household affected in Scotland. Our Government also deserves enormous credit for investing £300 million to tackle the worst side effects of austerity cuts but conference, make no mistake, the bedroom tax legislation is still on the statute books and those houses are still legally liable for it. Our welfare funds will not stem the tide of austerity and will not protect people from the further cuts that Chancellor George Osborne announced in his budget the week before last. And as we've seen from the press leaks in the last couple of days, uh, there's a lot more austerity coming down the line and our poorest people are still in the firing line. Listening to the Tories and indeed to the Labour Party, you'd think that more austerity and more cuts were inevitable and even desirable. And that cosy consensus needs to end. There's nothing inevitable and there's nothing desirable about more austerity. Enough is enough. 
The SNP has set out an alternative. Uh, we've set out a responsible path that we could take. And we need the influence now at Westminster to be able to help the UK as a whole steer a different path. That's exactly why we need a strong team of SNP MPs at Westminster holding the balance of power to stand up for our most disadvantaged citizens, to defend low-income families and support those least able to support themselves. And above all, to make sure that the power over our economy to make decisions about welfare, those decisions need to be made in Scotland where our government can be trusted to make the right choices and to help us build a fairer society. Please support the resolution. Thank you, Ailey. And Kevin Stewart, MSP, will second the resolution to be followed by Natalie McGarry. Welcome, Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, convener, and good afternoon, conference. Uh, as many of you uh, know, I represent Aberdeen Central. Uh, Aberdeen, the energy capital of Europe, uh, is often seen as being immensely wealthy. This week, one of our members, new members, Lindsay Davidson, contacted me while I was at Parliament to say that a food bank in our city run by instant neighbour had run out of food. A food bank in a rich city runs out of food. Now I have to say that Aberdonians rallied round uh, and gathered up uh, a huge amount of supplies for that food bank. But the reality is, conference, that that food bank and the hundreds of others that have sprung up across Scotland really should not exist in a wealthy society. I, I was brought up to believe uh, that we lived in a society where we paid in and we could get out because we had a safety net uh, for welfare payments. That conference has sadly gone and that safety net has had hole upon hole uh, driven into it by this Tory Liberal coalition at Westminster. But the most galling thing, conference, is the fact that the Labour Party, once the party of the working man and woman, are following exactly the same line as their Tory Liberal friends. So the only way that we can change the situation, end austerity, and actually uh, create, recreate that safety net is to send a strong bunch of SNP MPs uh, to Westminster on May the 7th. It is a real privilege um, to serve in the Scottish Parliament, but one of the most difficult things about my job and the job of many of my colleagues at this moment in time uh, is listening to the stories that we hear on an almost daily basis from people who are struggling to cope, struggling to survive because they have had their benefits slashed. These are folks, many who are in work, the working poor who are reliant on benefits, disabled people who have seen their benefits sometimes decrease by up to £4,000 a year. We must end that conference. We must send a, a strong team to Westminster on May the 7th. We must end austerity. And I would urge you to support this motion. Thank you, Kevin. And now I call Natalie McGarry, our candidate in Glasgow East, to be followed by Julie Hepburn. I don't know if I've ever got caught a clap before speaking. Uh, thank you very much. Conference, I'm standing here before you as your candidate in Glasgow East, a constituency that's a microcosm of the challenge of inequality. The popular conception of Glasgow East, uh, portrayed by the media who come up from London, is that it is a constituency which is blighted by poverty and inequality. But the real truth is that East has massive disparities in wealth, which is exactly the same way represented across our city and our country. It's not just about the differences across Scotland from areas where the life expectancy is 84 to areas like Shettleston, where it is 68, meaning that the average man gets one year's pension before he dies. But it's also about the disparities within our communities. 
To have such differences in wealth, cheek by jowl, is not the natural state of being. It's the result of deliberate political choices. Those choices are made mainly at Westminster by a political class who choose to use their powers to support austerity and to portray the poor as scroungers. They make these choices instead of trying to tackle the root inequality. The root cause of poverty is inequality in our communities. We have a Labour Party that likes to talk left while walking right. A Labour Party that backs George Osborne's budget to the hilt. A Labour Party which sells mugs proclaiming they will be tough on immigration. A Labour Party that only knocks at the door of tackling inequality. Well, I'm proud to be part of an SNP that wants to smash that door down. And I'm proud that we have a Scottish Government which does what it can to mitigate the worst effects of Westminster's malaise and choice. To me, our SNP Government has shown that with the full powers at our disposal, we can begin to do the work which has been neglected by successive UK governments. As our First Minister laid out yesterday, fair working and fair wages are the best way to tackle inequality. Marrying up the powers that we have with the powers we should have over the social security system, over the full range of employment legislation and over taxes and spending will mean our Scottish Government not just repairing the damage caused by Westminster, it will mean we can tackle the systemic and appalling, disgusting inequality that still blights our country. And we can make it our positive political choice to say no more, not in Scotland, not today. Please support the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. And the final speaker will be Julie Hepburn to speak in favour of the resolution. Julie Hepburn. Hi. Julie Hepburn, not a candidate. One of the things that, that first motivated me to get involved in politics at a young age was the issue of poverty. I think my first experience of it uh, as a child, it was, it was not myself, there was a wee lad that went to school, my primary school, and in the winter he used to come to school with carrier bags over his, his gym shoes, which, you know, to a young child just seemed really odd until my mum pointed out that it's probably just because his parents couldn't afford winter shoes. So as a teenager, when I started to think more about politics, it just seemed so outrageous to me that while some people had so much, other people had barely enough to live on. And I've been a political activist now for about 15 years, and it's one of the most depressing aspects of it that actually so little has changed for the poorest and most vulnerable in our society. So if I found poverty outrageous then, I can't begin to describe how much it incenses me today. As a mum of two young kids, I am acutely aware of how lucky I am and how lucky they are, because they never have to go without. I can't comprehend my wee girl looking up at me and saying, Mum, I'm hungry, can I have something to eat? No, sweetheart, I've not got anything in the house. Mum, I'm cold, can I have the heating on? No, I'm sorry, darling, I don't have enough money for the meter. Oh, Mum, my feet are sore. Sorry, darling, I don't have any money for, for new shoes. That would break my heart as a parent, but the reality is that's life for a lot of mums and dads across Scotland. Every parent wants the best for their child, and every child deserves the best start in life. This is Scotland in the 21st century and thousands of our kids right now are hungry. They don't have a warm winter coat, shoes that fit, a warm home. So while our children suffer, yet another Westminster government not only ignores their plight, but it makes life even harder for them. A government in London that we did not elect protects the interests of the rich and the elite, giving tax breaks to their pals while they attack the poorest and most vulnerable in our society. 
the bedroom tax, welfare cuts, sanctions, you name it, we didn't vote for any of it. We desperately need a strong team of SNP MPs at this coming election to halt the relentless attacks on people who simply don't deserve it. Enough is enough. And that's why we so desperately need powers over welfare to come to Scotland. So we can design a welfare system that protects our children and every other vulnerable person in our society, not punish them for the failings of successive Westminster governments and their banker pals. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. There are no cards in against. Can I ask conference, is the resolution passed by a claim? It is. Conference, can I ask for your consent that we start the topical resolutions five minutes early? Please show by a claim that that's with your agreement. Thank you very much. And we turn to topical resolution four on the oil and gas sector to be moved by Callum McCaig and seconded by Kirsty Blackman. And please welcome Callum McCaig, who is our candidate in Aberdeen South. Good afternoon, conference. Wow, you are looking wonderful. Um, it will not have escaped the notice of any of you uh, in this room or across the country that the price of oil has fallen substantially in the recent weeks and months. Now, that's caused particular cause for alarm in Aberdeen, where our world-class oil and gas industry is based. But that's an industry that supports tens of thousands of jobs across Scotland and across the rest uh, of the United Kingdom. Now, that resource has been marshalled, uh, or perhaps uh, ill-marshalled, by successive United Kingdom governments. In 2011, we saw a, a tax hike uh, of 12% uh, in the supplementary charge on oil and gas, announced uh, as a rabbit out of the hat by Danny Alexander, uh, who boasted about it. But that did a huge amount of damage to the confidence uh, of our oil and gas industry, which operates in a global field, seeking competition for investment uh, with basins right across the world. We do not have stability. Uh, if only, quite frankly, this wonderful resource uh, was marshalled by John Swinney and Fergus Ewing, as opposed to George Osborne and Ed Davey. I do not think we would be having these difficulties. A week and a half ago at the budget, Aberdeen took a collective sigh of relief. The UK government, under immense pressure from our government, from the industry and from Oil and Gas UK, reversed that disastrous hike. Uh, it provided a shot in the arm to the energy industry at a time when it was badly needed. The irony that it was uh, the, the, the same government that put it uh, in peril uh, should not be lost on anyone in this room. But that is a short-term measure. We need long-term stability for this industry to continue to flourish. And flourish it will if that support is given. Our enlightened friends in Norway when they introduced tax relief on drilling and exploration, saw a fourfold increase in the, the number of wells drilled. That brings greater production. Production brings greater investment. The investment brings jobs. The jobs bring prosperity. This is an investment in our future conference, and we must make that demand clear to the UK government. Whilst you marshal Scotland's resource, you must do so properly, you must do so prudently, and you must do so for the future. An exploration credit in terms of tax will do a long way to repairing the damage that they have caused to this industry. It will instill confidence back into the industry which has sorely been missed over the years. Conference, I, I do not hesitate in asking you to support this motion today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Callum. And from Aberdeen South to our candidate in Aberdeen North, please welcome Kirsty Blackman. Good afternoon, conference. Um, in Aberdeen, the oil industry is so important. I went to school in Aberdeen, and almost in every class, in the, 
many, many of my friends had parents who were in the oil industry. Many, many of my colleagues have been involved in the oil industry. When we're knocking on doors in the city, many, many people are involved in the industry. It's so important for Aberdeen and it's so important for Scotland. Um, conference, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Scottish Government for the swift action that they took when the oil price fell. They saw what way things were going. They saw the job losses that were happening in Aberdeen and they acted in order to, to mitigate those effects. Conference, in Aberdeen, this is having a huge effect on individuals and on families. I knocked on the door the other day and I spoke to a gentleman who's been involved in the industry for 30 years. In those 30 years, he has never been out of work. For the past 13 weeks, he has not managed to find any job. There, there has been nobody willing to take him on. The, the UK government conference were too slow. The UK government did not react. They dragged their heels and caused, caused lives for people, caused people to be concerned about how they were going to pay their mortgages, caused people to, to be out of work. If the UK government had made a decision and supported the industry more quickly, that would have been really, really useful for Aberdeen. Conference, the unionist collaboration in Aberdeen City Council are standing up there in that council chamber laughing and joking about the falling oil price. People are losing their jobs. Another 350 job losses, probable job losses were announced this week. And the unionists are laughing because the oil price has dropped. This is absolutely despicable behavior, conference. We need to support the oil industry. The oil industry has done an awful lot for Aberdeen and an awful lot for Scotland over the years. And we need to give them that little boost that they need at this moment in time in order that they can continue, in order that we are securing the future for the oil industry. Thank you very much, conference. Thank you, Kirsty. There are no cards and against. Can I ask conferences a resolution passed by acclaim? Okay. And just before I move to topical resolution five on moratorium and sanctions, can I say there will uh, be an opportunity for a book signing with Alex Salmond. And if you want uh, the book signed, well, I think you're going to have to buy a copy first. And uh, if you stay in the hall at the end of conference, we'll organize that, because maybe a few of you want to get it signed. So I'm just letting you know, at the end of conference, if you stay in the hall, if you want to have the book signed. Uh, we now go to topical resolution five. Please welcome back Ailey Whiteford to move the resolution to be seconded by Kevin Stewart, MSP. Ailey Whiteford is our working pension spokesperson at the Westminster Group. Welcome back, Ailey. I'm back again already. Conference, in the two years from October 2012, over 143,000 people in Scotland had benefit sanctions imposed on them under the new regime. I think it's worth at the outset just pointing out that there's always been a degree of conditionality in the benefit system, and I don't think anyone objects to sanctions being used as a last resort if they're proportionate and if they're fair. But the new sanctions regime is not proportionate and it's not fair uh, and instead it is being used as a first recourse and not as a last resort. What we're seeing is that some of the most vulnerable people in our society are falling through what's left of the social safety net and as the regime has uh, taken effect there's quite a lot of evidence emerging that some groups of claimants are falling foul of the sanctions regime more than others. Some of the people who are particularly vulnerable are those with learning disabilities or poor literacy, some, sometimes because they simply don't understand fully what's expected of them uh, in, in the system. But perhaps one of the most disturbing uh, manifestations that we've seen is that six out of ten of the people who are being sanctioned uh, under the new regime are people with mental health problems. Now, we could talk a, a lot about different changes that have taken place under the welfare reforms, but the introduction of the work capability assessment, I'm sure most people here will be aware, has caused a lot of controversy because of the way it's assessing uh, people's health and the way in which it's not managing to pick up people with fluctuating conditions and how it's uh, not always finding people, uh, finding that people who are found fit for work under the new assessment very clearly, very manifestly, 
uh, aren't fit for work, and I'm sure there's not a, an MP or an MSP here today who hasn't had to deal with dozens of cases uh, trying to help people who've been found fit for work, who are clearly not fit for work, even to uh, the most obvious, uh, the, at the most obvious level. And what we're seeing is that people with mental health problems are, are being sanctioned disproportionately. Uh, six out of ten people who are being sanctioned, making that transition from employment support allowance to job seekers allowance, are just not uh, being able to comply with the conditions. And some of them are falling out of the welfare system entirely. And they're among those who are now using food banks, just not claiming benefits at all, falling back on family, friends and the charity uh, to be found in our communities. Another group that's falling very foul of the sanctions regime, again disproportionately represented, is single parents. And I think it doesn't take a genius to work out that that's because uh, single parents have to sometimes change their plans at short notice. It can be difficult if you've got a sick child and nobody on hand to help you with childcare, or simply your childcare falls through. So we need a sanctions regime that takes account of people's real lives uh, and takes account of how difficult it can be for all of us, uh, those of us in employment, uh, as well as those who are looking for work, sometimes struggle uh, to, to run our lives just on exactly the timetable that, that we planned and hoped. So Citizens Advice Scotland have called for a moratorium and I think we need to take that very seriously because they're the people with the evidence. Please support the resolution, please support that moratorium so that we can have a proper review of the system and that we can make recommendations to improve it and make it fit for purpose. Thank you, Lee. And Kevin Stewart, MSP, to second, to be followed by Rona Patterson. Uh, thank you and hello again, conference. Um, during the course of the welfare reforms study into what is happening out there, uh, one of my colleagues heard of a case of a woman who'd missed an appointment and had been sanctioned. Uh, the woman had missed her appointment at the job centre because she was in labour at the time. Uh, and she actually told them this, but was still sanctioned. This is the kind of lunacy uh, that we have going on at this moment in time. We've heard from Ailey about uh, Citizens Advice uh, and their call for a moratorium, and I think that that is the right thing uh, to do uh, at this moment. Uh, last week, figures were published uh, which so showed that 3,600 households with children uh, were affected by sanctions between June 2012 and May 2013. That affected 6,460 Scottish children. I think that it is absolutely unacceptable that we are using a welfare regime to punish children. <laughs> Conference, I really do believe that we could do much better uh, and I do believe that if we had control over all welfare policy our approach would be so much different uh, to what we currently have and that's why we need to send MPs down to Westminster to fight to ensure that those powers come to Scotland. But let's look at sanctions and I'm going to leave you with this question. Right? This government is quite happy to sanction the poorest and the most vulnerable in our society. But what sanctions have been imposed on tax avoiders and on the bankers who got us into this mess in the first place? It's time for something different, conference. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. And our final speaker on this resolution will be Rona Patterson. Welcome, Rona. Thank you, convener. Good afternoon, conference. Uh, Rona Patterson, Keith Branch, convener. Again, not a candidate. <laughs> and I'm not going to take much of your time on this this afternoon because I'm sure you don't need much persuading to actually support this resolution. I was delighted to see it uh, put forward. I'd actually put forward a very similar uh, resolution, and I think a few others had, had put others forward as well. So 
uh, obviously is a, a very topical resolution. The reason I had decided to put it forward was actually because of a TV programme that I had seen the other night about the plight of these people who have been suffering under the benefit sanction regime. I was horrified that people, through no fault of their own in many of the cases, were left with no money to buy food, electricity, etc. One of the cases was a young lad whose letter had actually gone to the wrong address and he missed his appointment. And he was sanctioned for six weeks. He was a diabetic and due to the lack of food, he slipped into a diabetic coma. This is a story that can be replicated time and time again. There's many, many stories like these. Once I'd been made aware of this, and I'd actually spoken to Christina McKelvey, and I was made aware of um, Pat's petition, ceasefire. And if you look that up, it was set up by Pat Onions. And I would urge you to please look at that and sign that also, which is also this supporting what the resolution today is. The system's not working. There is a need for a wide-ranging debate. Do Dr. Paul Litchfield, the government assessor, has produced his final report stating ESA and WCA are not fit for purpose, and he's suggesting the need to rethink the process. And this will apparently take five years. So the ceasefire for these five years is urgent. The whole programme was initiated under a Labour government with full support of the Tories and continued by the coalition with Labour support. In May, when we sent down our team of SNP MPs, we will shake them up and I'm sure we'll force them to look in a more sympathetic way and hopefully transfer the powers to Holyrood. Please support this resolution. Thank you, Rona. There are no cards in against conference, so I ask, is the resolution passed by acclaim? <laughs> it is. And finally, on topical resolution six, crisis in Kurdistan, I call Dr. Kamal Kajuli to move to be seconded by Bob Doris, MSP. Welcome, Kamal. Good afternoon, delegates. I have been to this SMP conference in 1988, 1990, 91, when the first time in 88 when Saddam Hussein has attacked chemical weapons on the city, our Kurdish city of Halabja where over 5,000 people got perished within a period of two hours. Human, animal, and plants and the environment all got destroyed. His regime has been toppled in 2003. And after this, people thought they, the area, Iraq, will go to peace and stability. But that didn't happen for many, many reasons. But they allowed the remnant of Saddam military, police, secret service to come back. And they got funding from some of the, the, the Gulf Arabic uh, countries. And they started a campaign of discrimination, trying to create a civil war in Iraq by, by going putting a bomb in a, in, a, in, a, in a Sunni mosque blaming the Shia putting a bomb in a Shia mosque, blaming the Sunni, putting a bomb in a, in, a, in a Christian church, blaming the Muslim, killing a Kurd, blaming an Arab. And they carried on a campaign of daily, daily car bombs in all the cities in, in Iraq. The Kurdish cities, Baghdad, South, North, South, they, they did not allow somebody not to be touched. And with the car bombs, that means they destroyed you know, that neighborhood, that place, no matter 
the market, market could be uh, anybody in the market, could be you and I visiting that market there. Therefore, just to try to create uh, the havoc there. Now, these people, they started to join with them or made arrangement to come up with another terrorist organization in the form of Qaeda, who are, who are, they are Salafi Wahhabi. They have this black flag, which do not represent Islam, which do not represent Muslim people, because these Salafi Wahhabi do not believe in Sunnah or Shia Muslim. They do not believe in humanity. They do not believe in Christianity. They do not believe in Judaism. They do not believe in, in, in anything a normal human being uh, can possess. They been able, the Ba'ths, remnant of the Ba'ths, Saddam Hussein, they joined the Salafi Wahhabi Qaeda style. Two evils they joined together over two years ago, and now they come up with a new organization called I IS, ISIS, ISIL, or we call them Daesh. And two years ago, they got more funding from many countries, especially some countries in the, in the Gulf region. And they have came up with a, with a much more ruthless campaign, just a total destruction, total destruction of the, the started in Iraq, then they went to Syria, then they went to North Africa, Egypt, Libya, and uh, Nigeria, Somalia, and lately in Yemen. Therefore, they created a, a, the havoc among the civilians. People simply, they just hear that ISIS is coming. They, everybody have just to leave everything, just run away with their clothing and go and run away. They have actually killed over half a million people within a period of, of, of two, two years from the region. And the, the, this destruction is still going on. From that, from that, in our Kurdistan region, we got, within a period of four months, 1.9 million refugees. I just came back from there three, three weeks ago, and I have seen the Malak's situation time. of the refugees. Time's up. Okay, just, just one line. One line. Okay, thanks. That was quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be five minutes. They need the support. The people there, they need the support. I. How you just imagine that you have a country size of Scotland, five million people within a period of four months, you get 1.9 million people pouring on your doorstep from all over Iraq wow, and Syria. Fine. What do you do? The Kurdistan regional government, it, they try their best. The people, they, everybody take five, six families to their homes. I went and visited them. Kamal. This is an important issue. I just wanted to highlight a highlight. To highlight this serious, very, very serious crisis, you don't hear much in the news media in this country, and in many parts, they don't tell you what I told you just now. And, and this is important. <laughs> and I, am, I have been with supporter and worked with SNP, with Nicola Sergeant. Uh -huh. Kamal, with, it's not fair with, another speaker the if they don't get called. Since the 1980s, trying to campaign for these things. We, we tried our, our best. SMP has a heart, and I recently decided to join, and I am a member, and I'm very proud to be a member of SMP. Yeah. Come on. Kamal, come on, you're stopping other yes. speakers getting speaking. Mic off. And Bob Doris to second. Two minutes, please, Bob. 
convener, I can promise you I'll be, I'll be brief. I don't mind giving up most of my time for Dr. Cattulli. It was a privilege to listen to it. I just want to um, tell you about some friends of mine. I want to tell you about Shaka Sata and his mum Tuba. They both stay in Mary Hill. His mum Tuba is just back from Kurdistan. She was there because three of her relatives are Peshmerga and they passed away because of the struggles against ISIL. It affects my constituents. I want to tell you about Dr. Masood. He also stays in Mary Hill. He lost 15 family members on Mount Sinja, 15, simply because they're Yazidis. Dead, gone. I want to tell you about two and a half years ago when myself and Anne McLaughlin, then uh, I, I have to say Anne McLaughlin and myself went out there with Shaka Sata to Iraq, to Kurdish Iraq, and we visited many places, including Halabja, where we laid a reef to play tribute to the those that died in the genocide at the hands of the brutal Saddam Hussein, but we also visited a refugee camp at Arbat. Two and a half years ago, myself and Anne saw that. Two and a half years ago, that refugee camp was bursting at its seams. I have no idea how they're even trying to cope at all, just now, given everything that has happened. Our Scottish government's got a really proud record internationally, whether it's Malawi, whether it's in Africa in relation to Ebola, whether it's in Palestine. We try to project the kind of country we wish to do to be internationally, with love, with kindness, with compassion, and with solidarity. What this motion asks us to do, this resolution asks us to do, is to see how we can extend that love, that compassion, that solidarity, and that kindness as a Scottish government internationally and help the poor, the suffering, the vulnerable, the disadvantaged in other parts of the world in relation to this particular no, resolution in Kurdistan. I'll just finish off by saying that the last two topical resolutions we, we looked at spoke very passionately about the poor and the disadvantaged and the vulnerable here in Scotland, and rightly so. Please pass this topical resolution to tell Scotland it's not just the poor, it's not just the vulnerable, it's not just the disadvantaged in Scotland we care about. We care about them wherever they are in the world. Please help the Kurdish people. Thank you, Bob. There are no cards in against. So can I ask conference, is the resolution passed by acclaim? It is, thank you very much. We're just shortly going to hear from the Deputy Leader of the Party. So would you like, for the last time at conference, to see the new party broadcast? That was pretty good, but I'm sure you can do better than that. Would you really like to see the new party broadcast? Then let's roll it. This is our place, our country. I don't think we're better than any other country, but I think we're every bit as good. And I know we're capable of doing more given half a chance. Sure, it can be a wee bit rough around the edges sometimes. And it's fair to say we like having a laugh, but that doesn't mean to say we don't care. We care passionately. I know we can be an argumentative bunch. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, especially if it gets stuff done. Proud, optimistic, full of hope, and gallus as hell on occasion. No apologies. That's just who we are. I know where I'm from. What I'm asking is where are we going? 
Last year was a roller coaster. Everyone wants change now. And there's an election coming up. I remember when Labour used to stand up to the Tories. That's just not happening anymore. It's time for new ideas. Something positive. Something different from cuts, cuts, cuts. So who's going to shout no way, enough, to unfair policies? Who's going to look out for our kids, for our jobs, for our NHS? And who's going to keep Westminster to its promise of more power for Scotland? The question for us here in Scotland isn't which Westminster party will become the next UK government. The question is, who's really going to stand up for Scotland? Well, Conference. Conference, please welcome back the leader of the Scottish National Party, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. Friends. Conference. What? What a wonderful weekend this has been. You know, to all of you who are new members of the SNP, I hope you've enjoyed your very first experience of an SNP conference. I can tell you this, we have certainly enjoyed the new energy you have brought to our party and the enthusiasm that you've shown over the course of this weekend. To each and every single one of our new members, let me say this. You have not just made our party bigger, you have made our party better and you have made it stronger. So, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for choosing to be part of our family. You know, my, my first ever SNP conference was in Dundee, that other great yes city. There were less than 500 people at that conference. Things have changed a wee bit since then. We've got an awful lot bigger. I think we're going to need, a, need an even bigger venue next time round. This has really been a conference of firsts. It's been my first full conference as leader of the party and as First Minister of Scotland. It's Stuart's first conference as deputy leader of the party. We've tried lots of new things this weekend, including the fantastic new SNP app, which has already been downloaded by 5,000 people. So if you've not done it yet, get onto your phones and download it straight away, or wait until after Stuart's spoken and then download it. This has been an absolutely fantastic conference. It's not quite over yet though. We've got one or maybe two highlights left for you. And the first of these highlights, of course, is the address by our deputy leader. You know, I've been leader of this party for just five months and I could not have wished for a better deputy leader than Stuart Hosey. As, as we have been preparing for the Westminster election, Stuart has been leading the charge, he's been overseeing the writing of our manifesto and with our other MPs he's been holding the Tories, Labour and Liberals to account in the House of Commons. So he is a fantastic deputy leader of our party and I know you are going to enjoy hearing from him in just a few seconds. Uh, but yesterday I told you that the SNP membership now stands at 102,143 members. I can exclusively reveal to you that since my speech yesterday afternoon, another 700 people 
have joined our party. So, I think, I think all I really want to say is no pressure, Stuart. <laughs> Conference, please give a rousing welcome to our wonderful Deputy Leader, Stuart Hosey MP. An extra 700 members. No pressure. We'll have to start getting more family members to join up. <laughs> Friends, we have come a very long way indeed since the 18th of September last year from a referendum which was an act of national self-confidence and an act of national self-determination. And whatever our opponents say, it was profoundly positive, hugely democratic, and we should be proud of it. And how could it not be when tens of thousands of activists like us were knocking on the doors of over a million identified independent supporters in the culmination of the biggest political campaign Scotland has ever seen. But as we've said, the result, although disappointing, was clear and we do not deny it. Nor though can anyone deny the incredible enthusiasm and energy which that campaign brought to Scotland, re-energizing politics in every single corner of our land. But for me, it's what's happened since that's both fascinating and exciting for the future. We came to terms with the referendum result. Our opponents did not. Our determination to keep on campaigning for more powers was unmatched. Our opponents were caught flat-footed. They thought it would be uh, business as usual. The determination that we had was shared by many, so that our party membership is now more than 102,000 members. And, and the opinion polls have given us a substantial lead over Labour for six months. Our focus is now on winning the general election in Scotland. That is the next part of our nation's democratic journey. So, let me be clear. This election cannot and will not be a rerun of the referendum. It is Scotland's chance to hold Westminster to account, uh, to ensure they keep their promise, fulfill the pledge, honour the vows they gave to the Scottish people, and that was to deliver maximum devolution. That's the bar. That's the bar they set. It's our job to make sure they deliver. So let's remind ourselves precisely what it was we were offered. Gordon Brown said we're going to be within one to two years the closest thing to a federal state. It sounded very similar to the pledge of the vow made by the Prime Minister. If we get a no vote, he said, it would trigger major unprecedented program of devolution. And as we know, it was that promise of maximum powers which encouraged large numbers of people to vote no in the referendum. So we will now reach out beyond those who voted yes to those who voted no, expecting substantial new powers 
and we will create a majority in Scotland for a Scottish Parliament with maximum power. Our opponents know we'll do that, which is why we now have a new vow. The vow two, the return of the vow, the vow max. Labour politicians trying to pull the same stunt before an election they pulled before the referendum. But we will not be fooled this time and the Scottish people will not be conned. Friends, the only way to make sure Westminster delivers on anything will be to return the largest number of SNP MPs ever to Westminster. And returning a large group of SNP MPs who will work together first to ensure promises made are delivered and secondly to protect and further Scottish interests is vital. It will make the Scottish National Party the guarantors of real new powers. But as the First Minister has said, that we are not simply talking about power for Scotland but an end to austerity and cuts. You see, if the decisions which affect our lives are not taken here, they'll be taken somewhere else, and we've seen the consequences of that. An austerity programme from an austerity government which failed to deliver the growth the economy needs and is instead committed to making the same mistakes all over again. Remember what George Osborne promised. Debt would begin to fall as a share of GDP this year. The current account would be in balance next year. Borrowing would be reduced to barely £20 billion. Friends, debt did not fall as a share of GDP. The current account will not be back in the black for years. And borrowing won't be barely £20 billion this year. It'll be nearly four times as much at £75 billion. George Osborne has failed to meet any one of the single key fiscal targets he set for himself. <laughs> Friends, Tory policy strangled recovery in the early part of this Parliament. And with 30 billion of new cuts to come, we are on track unless we change for a decade of austerity. We know it's failed, but it's worse than that. He's gone from a ratio of cuts to tax rises of four to one to nine to one, the clearest indication of a government trying to balance the books on the back of the poor. To that, we say no thanks. So there is a real alternative. A vote for the SNP is a vote to say enough is enough to Labour, Liberal or Tory cuts. A vote for the SNP will, possibly for the first time, give the Scottish people power to achieve real change at Westminster. And we need to change, not just to say no to austerity, but to deliver real economic decision making to Scotland not just 30% of our tax base or 15% of our welfare budget, but the power to turn potential into profit, profit into prosperity, to deliver that prosperity with a purpose, not just to grow the economy, to fund our public services, but to squeeze inequality out of society, to underpin that economic growth in the first place. So, the big picture is a half percent modest real terms increase in public spending, bringing down the deficit while ending the austerity cuts. But there's more. I hope we have a huge group of SNP MPs.
to vote for a national minimum wage rising to £8.70 by the end of 2020. A group of MPs who will press for a far more substantial take-up of the living wage. A group of MPs who will take tough action on tax avoidance. Friends, our MPs will vote for a tough tax dodgers bill. We will also provide certainty for our senior citizens. We will vote to keep the triple lock on pension increases. We will support a fairer Scotland and we will prioritise the immediate scrapping of the bedroom tax. We will seek a halt to the rollout of universal credit and personal independence payments, stopping, <laughs> stopping the savage cuts to disability benefits and, and we will demand urgent changes to the DWP sanctions regime which leaves people vulnerable, penniless and queuing at food banks, which is wrong in a rich country. We will vote to end the unfair use of zero hours contracts. We will support the small business community, not by simply backing the Scottish business bonus, which we will, but by seeking proper legal protection to ensure small businesses are not only paid, but paid on time. And we'll keep our eye on the ball in the North Sea. SNP MPs will vote against the damaging tax changes we saw early in this Parliament. We will protect our place in the world and oppose an inner referendum on Europe. And, yeah. And should one come, we will vote to stay in. But as Nicola has said, we will also insist on a double lock so that Scotland can never be dragged out of the EU against the wishes of our people. <clears throat> but there's another thing. Labour talk about redistribution and they point to the 50p rate of tax. We've seen it come down, the tax cut for millionaires. You, all of you, should be proud. This party moved the vote against the tax cut for millionaires. Every one of our MPs has already voted against a tax cut for millionaires when it counted. For all the talk, the Labour Party did not. So let there, <laughs> let there be absolutely no doubt we would not have cut the 50p tax rate for the very highest earners during a recession. We still think it's right that those with the very broadest shoulders should burden a little more of the burden. So in the next Parliament, SNP MPs will support the reintroduction of a 50p rate of tax. We've also said we couldn't countenance supporting a new generation of nuclear weapons. The UK, friends, does not have £100 billion to spend on Trident and its replacement. And even if it did, these are indiscriminate weapons of mass destruction, and we say no. So, what have our opponents? particularly Labour,
done about these issues. They voted with the Tories for more austerity, 30 billion of cuts on the 13th of January this year. The following week, they trooped through the lobbies to support 100 billion pounds on Trident and its replacement friends. They've even managed to abstain on a moratorium on fracking. But this election isn't about the British Labour Party, it's about Scotland and her people. So to get more power for Scotland, to end austerity cuts, to say no to Trident and its replacement, we simply must win in May. Now, I have no doubt we can and we will send the largest number of MPs to Westminster. But there's a potential to do more than that, to hold the balance of power. We know the opinion polls are in our favour. The Ashcroft polls in particular show us ahead in seats we previously could only dream of winning. But this is only potential. So our job now is to work like never before because not a vote has been cast, not a ballot counted, not a seat declared. Let's turn that potential into votes, votes into seats, and then this party will deliver for Scotland. Thank you very much. It's not a competition, <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Friends, uh, I have another little task to do. Can I please invite to the stage and can you all give a huge welcome to all of our Westminster candidates. Candidates.
Friends, over the next 39 days, we have the opportunity to make the voice of Scotland heard at Westminster like never before. We have the opportunity to send these talented men and women to Westminster to fight Scotland's corner, to stand up for this country's interests, to fight for an alternative to the Tory and Labour austerity that is penalising the poorest in our society, to say the loudest and clearest no to a new generation of Trident nuclear weapons on the Clyde. <laughs> to stand up for our National Health Service and make sure it always stays in public hands. And we have the opportunity. We have the opportunity to send a strong team to Westminster to redeem that vow and win real powers for our Scottish Parliament. That, that my friends, is the opportunity we now have. It is the responsibility we now carry on behalf of the people of this country. But we must get out there and we must work like we have never worked before to win the trust of the people of Scotland, to win their votes, to persuade them that the best, indeed the only way to make this country's voice heard, to make sure that Westminster never again gets to ignore or sideline Scotland is to vote SNP and send the strongest team to fight our corner. I'm pretty confident by the time this weekend draws to a close, our party membership will stand at upwards of 103,000. So if all of us, if each and every one of us gets out there and works like we have never worked before, then the momentum of the Scottish National Party on behalf of the people of Scotland will be unstoppable. So let us get out there and win for Scotland. Thank you very much.